Hi, some of you will have seen the mailbag in which uh, I received this device, which is a uh, Tektronix J16 digital photometer. Uh, and I kind of opened it up a little bit in that, I had a quick look at the circuit, but uh, nothing in depth and decided that I would leave it to a separate video. So here it is apart and um, we've got all the circuit boards and everything here. We've got the detachable probe just here and we confirmed in the mailbag that this is detachable and it mounts onto a tripod if needs be. And uh, obviously you should have a 15 way cable to uh, wire the two things together. So here's the socket on one and the plug on the other. And there's actually a tripod mount on the bottom of this as well. Um, so uh, constituent parts, obviously the circuit, the probe, the case, this is a battery caddy uh, and uh, this slots out very easy. You just take off the back and uh, it pulls out. And uh, there are four connectors on the back. Now two of those are for the battery and the battery charger version. But there's another version of this in the same can, which uses the other two pins and provides an AC input. So essentially you can get this can with either a bunch of batteries in it or a transformer in it. This is the battery version. Now I've charged these batteries overnight and finally left on trickle charge. So there should be about 7.2 volts on these, but I can guarantee you there isn't. Um, and I just really, before thinking even about buying a new set of batteries, I just actually wanted to make sure these hadn't got any life in them. So voltage, 5.015. Now I can tell you that uh, at half past 11 last night, when I uh, disconnected the charger from this, it had reached just shy of six volts and it wasn't going any further to, to be honest. So I knew these batteries were, were duff, but uh, clearly they are, are not gonna make it in terms of using them as a set of batteries. Now I can get uh, replacement batteries for these. These are 180, uh, sorry, 1,800 milliamps each, milliamp hours each. And they're sub C type batteries, so they're a 188. The charger for them, um, which I did manage to find the spec, um, the charger for this unit, and the sort of plug-in, you know, power pack, so to speak, is a nine volt power pack DC uh, at a fixed current of 200 milliamps. Um, so the box is nothing special, a piece of extruded aluminium. Um, compared to the boxes that you buy nowadays that are extruded aluminium like this. So, so if we look at this end, we can see this is bog standard off the shelf box, really just sprayed in uh, Tektronix colors. Um, unfortunately, uh, yeah, as I say, you can get this type of box relatively easy, so it's the equivalent but it will be a third of the thickness. This is about a three millimeter bottom on this. It's crazy, really. Okay, let's put that out of the way somewhere. <laughs> okay, the back is just, you know, back plate, nothing exciting there. We've talked about this caddy. And uh, yeah, let's, uh, I haven't opened this up yet. Oh, I don't know if I can. Oh yeah, there we go. Wow. So I'm not expecting a lot in there or in this, although there will be a bit of circuitry. Now I don't have the service manual for this probe. So there we go, not much in there at all. Let's see if we can zoom in a little bit. So we've got a switch down here, just a normal slide switch. That's going to uh, do the pins. We've got a sensor just here with a red and black wire, which also goes directly to two of the pins. And over here, we've got a trimmer, which is a calibration adjustment, which also goes to two of the pins. Um, and that's your lot. There's nothing else in there. So here, what have we got here? We've got a lens in the front end and we've got a focal adjustment. The lens in the front end and we've got a focal adjustment just here. So we can actually um, slide uh, this assembly backwards and forwards to just focus the uh, photodiode. Uh, and that's it, that's all she wrote. So there's no electronics in there. Now, what's the slide switch? Is it on off? No, it is not. It's actually a, oh, will it focus? There we go. Oh, do the right way up. There you go. It's a hold button. So essentially, it's just signaling through this cable that the main body is to do a sample hold on the uh, output from the photodiode. And that, that's, that's your lot now. So the other thing that's on here is a little link between two of the pins. 
So one is common with the switch, uh, and there's a link that comes across to another pin and doesn't really go anywhere. But that will be to tell the, the base unit, I mean, Tektronix call it a mainframe, it's a little bit overnamed, um, what type of probe is attached. Or, or it will actually just set the scale because on the actual device, of course, we've got different types of readout. Um, <clears throat> so that's how the probe will communicate its uh, correct scale back to the uh, back to the mainframe. So moving out then to the uh, to the main circuit, um, what I'm going to do, I think, is uh, we'll connect up a bit of power. I don't have the correct power adapter for this, unfortunately, but I do have a power supply, of course. Now I'm using a slightly weird connector here because this will enable me to uh, connect it up easily without. Uh, risking anything and I just need to get my cables the right way around. So I apologize for any fan noise that we pick up here. So nine volts and I'll set the current limit to 200 millivolts, just like the... Uh... Okay, so I've got my power supply set up to nine volts, 200 milliamps. And we'll turn it on. And this is turned off at the moment on its front panel. Let's hold up. And it's dead to the world. Yep, my output is on and it is current limited. Okay, so the voltage has dropped off and that has current limited. Okay, so switch to top view and let's have a, a little look. So on this side, of course, we've just got the seven segment displays and a few LEDs down there. That's on the display board. Uh, and then we've got all these resistors to current limit into those seven segment displays. We've got a bunch of 74 logic, and these are primarily one of them won't be because it's a three and a half digit display, but three of them will just be a BCD to seven segment decoders. And then, if we come back a little bit um, and I zoom in to this in front of so here we've got our something decoder and just here we've got four pins so these are going to be the bcd value that's going into that decoder four pins here for that one and another four pins there so if you wanted to put on the option <coughs> i can't remember the number let's see if i can read it yeah if we want to install option seven which is the bcd to analog output uh, those pins there and there's another pair over here for the overflow into the last digit um, those pins there would be where we would take the majority of those signals from there's probably another couple of pins elsewhere to pick off another few signals there'll obviously be a ground connection for example um, but uh, for the moment that's where most of those signals will come from okay cool um, so on this side um, we'll basically just have some bcd counters um, now Although the analog input is coming in from this plug here, it's pretty much coming in these uh, sockets. And uh, essentially, to a large extent, those are buggering off and going straight down to the board below. So this is just sort of acting as a transition board to take those signals down to uh, the second board below. So this top board is pretty much all digital. Um, so is there any exception to that? Well, yeah, over here, we've got what's essentially the analog to digital converter circuit. So in here, we've got a 555 timer. Uh, we've got an op amp, we've got another op amp. So what this will be doing is it will be doing integration. So, so the idea with integration is that we have a flat input voltage, say three volts, and uh, we configure an operation amplifier as an integrator. So what that does, um, the integral of a flat voltage is a slope, which depends upon um, the steepness of the slope, depends upon the input voltage. So um, what we do with that is we time how long it takes to get from zero volts and for that slope to reach some preset threshold. So as we're doing that, we have the clock signal, which is provided by the 555 timer in this case. Um, so we start our conversion, at, we're at zero volts, and we count how many pulses occur until we reach the threshold on the output of the uh, integrator. 
And we do that, of course, using a comparator, which is just another configuration of an operational amplifier. When that comparator goes high, then we latch the current count into a latch, uh, and then we transfer that across into the BCD to seven segment decoders. Uh, and that's a lot, and it just stays there. And of course, we can go straight into the next conversion. Um, so this will count using three, um, it's actually decade or BCD counters. So they'll, each counter will count from 0 to 10, then overflow, the next one will count uh, the overflows and so on. So that's it. That's how that entire circuit will work. Now there'll be a bit of fine tuning around uh, that to make it stable and repeatable and reliable and stuff like that. But you know, we're not going to go into that in, in this video. So there it is. Um, and that's pretty much all of that side, I think. Let's turn it over and have a look at the other side. Um, so up at the front here, we've obviously got our range selections. So these are like times 10, times 1, times 10, times etc. Um, so what you'd normally expect to see is you expect to see a JFET input on here. And that's because we've got multiple types of different probe. So each probe is going to be providing a different output impedance. Um, and we don't want our circuit here to load that down. So the easiest way is to provide a really, really high input impedance into this circuit. Uh, and I reckon that's going to be this guy here. So this guy here is a, uh, looks like it's two transistors back to back, and that's almost certainly going to be a JFET pair in that uh, can. Uh, and it's very close to the input, and uh, so I, I think that one of them essentially will be providing the uh, input impedance translation, and the other will be doing the first stage of amplification. Um, and then across here, we've got a couple of uh, op amps um and uh yeah and not a lot else to be perfectly honest now one of those i suspect might actually be the battery test um just here because that's the battery test button so that's just going to be comparing the voltage on the battery against some um uh, reference voltage that's independent of the supply rails uh, and this is just the on off button on the end so that's kind of most of that circuit there so what's all this circuit back here doing well, this, I mean, these are 741 op amps and things like that. So those are going to be running at plus minus 12 or plus minus 15 volts, something in that region, so that we can get sufficient dynamic range out of the device. Because this has got quite a lot of dynamic range. If we think about, you know, it's got a times one right the way to times a thousand. That's, that's quite a lot. And it's got to come in from this thing here. So we need a fair bit of amplification. We need a fair bit of dynamic range. So we need reasonable voltages on these ICs. Um, and of course we need to do two things. We've got an unregulated input. It could be AC and I can see there's, uh, there's a couple of places where there are bridge rectifiers. There's a bridge rectifier here and there's another bridge rectifier over here. Um, so I suspect this one is rectifying if we have an AC input and this one is rectifying if we have a DC input. And why is it having to rectify? Well, because we've got a little step up transformer just here. So I reckon what's coming, happening is we've got DC coming in there'll be a multi-vibrator circuit just here, which will feed this transformer. This transformer will generate, you know, I don't know, 18 volts, let's say, AC, which is rectified. Um, and um, what will happen is, um, probably, because I don't see many active components over on this side, is that that will be fed back to a couple of these transistors, um, which will alter the multivibrator to regulate that to give us the DC voltage that we actually want. Uh, just here, I reckon, will be a uh, just a DC DC converter to get the five volts for all this logic. Um, it's a bit of an oversized transistor, I think, but uh, yeah, that's pretty much what will be happening there. So, okay, let's um, try and find out what's wrong with this. So. As always, really, we need to start our investigation with the power supply section. Now, there's a couple of choices here. Um, we can kind of take this board off because it's got the power supply on it. That will be beneficial for fault finding because it will separate it from all of this load. So if there's a problem with the load, the power supply will, will work. Um, I'm going to have a quick probe just with that connected up for a minute or two. Um, and just see what voltages I get. So just need to get my head straight on which way around these connectors go again. 
Now I might need to switch across to the scope later because I might need to look at the signals on these transistors, but uh, hmm, it would probably be a good idea at this point if I got my circuit diagram out and started having a look to see what goes where. Oh yeah, there it is, circuit diagram and layout right next to it. So let's have a look at the five volt. Where the hell's the five volt go? Oh, comes out the bottom of Q150, Q150. So it comes out the emitter of Q150. And what I'm gonna to have to do is turn this board the other way around because my diagram is backwards. It'd be a lot easier if I have the board facing the same direction. Uh, <laughs> as the diagram that I'm referring to. Okay, so I'm using these mini probes that I got in the uh, post the other day. Uh, so BCE e is the nearest. Oh, it's actually labelled on the board anyway. Um, so I want the ground. Ground just goes to the chassis, so that's easy. So those are voltage coming on the board. Let's have a look at five volts. So we'll briefly turn it on. Measure our five volt output. So we don't have our five volt output. We do have 5.6 volts there, which is pretty much the input voltage, I reckon. Yeah, so I'm just gonna turn that off. So I don't have a five volt output. Let me see where I can get my 12 volt output. So on the diagram, oops, so I'm just about getting there. You see our voltage comes in here, it goes through the switch on the end of capacitor 106. I might have a quick look at that in a minute. And it comes through here. And this little, uh, this three transistors and this uh, Zener just here create the regulated five volt output. Um, so obviously there could be a problem with that. Um, so because something is pulling the, uh, pulling the voltage down a long way dropping down to five point something volts. So I've got my five point something volts on uh, the collector. So that is transmitting through. Um, I do not have five volts on here, but part of that might just be there's not enough voltage to drive all of that circuit, or it might be that that circuit is knackered. So our next um, set of outputs would be the 12 volt side, and we can take an output uh, here from this uh, bridge rectifier, I guess. Uh, unfortunately, it doesn't individually number these parts, so that's slightly awkward. Um, and I probably can't get at the bottom of the C142200 microfarads. Uh, there's almost certainly a 15 volt takeoff somewhere. The 15 volt feeds back over to this side here. So this will be the multivibrator circuit, and these will be the two drive transistors for the transformer. Um, in fact, actually, yeah, yeah, that's correct. So um, there's plenty of places we can look at voltages around here. Uh, on the end of 190, of resistor 192, and just here is one place, and hopefully somewhere over here. Let's have a little look and just uh, track down those parts. This is turned off again, by the way. I've got a transformer output just here. And one just here. There to there. There to there. So that must be plus 15 volts, this test pin just here. And we're getting about 1.8 volts. So that's pretty disastrous. Yeah, minus 0.4. So that's hopeless uh, completely. Just double checking, make sure I've got my power connected. Yes, I have. Okay, well, that's a mess, isn't it? Right, so um, we can't do anything until we have appropriate power in the right places. So I reckon my next move okay, is going to be to... Um, separate out the power board just to make sure that there's no undue loading of the other board. That's just a simple quick test. Now usually um, 
if you want to test power, often there is a, a means to disconnect the power supply from the rest of the circuit. So, and you want to do that ideally because you want to remove any question about whether it's the power supply that's faulty or whether the rest of the circuit is actually drawing the power supply down. Now at the moment, because the input voltage is being pulled down so low, it's very hard to work out um, what might be doing that. Uh, let me put this out of the way somewhere. Yeah, it's fine. Okay, so let's have a little look at this now. Now we still don't really have separation between the power supply and the uh, and the circuits that it feeds, but uh, we're certainly better. We've only got a few components up on the top here. Um, now I do have to be a bit cautious at this point because there's a whole set of there we go. We see in this light, whole set of pins here that penetrate through. So I could do with something to put this in just to stop it. Uh, getting damaged okay there we go so that'll just stop those pins getting distorted on the back while i work on it i hope okay so there we go power on this end um is anyone need to remember really uh and we know the power gets back through there because we've tested it on this transistor just here um, so, uh, let's quick look at the diagram there. So the power comes in, it goes to a 0.27 resistor and into C106, which is 100 microfarad. The power supply isn't on. That's better. Yeah, that's all right. And discharging slowly, so I'm not too worried about that. I thought before going too much further that it might be worth having a quick look at the circuit diagram together. Um, now, we've got our input on the left hand side, these are just the batteries essentially and a power switch and stuff like that. We've got this 100 microfarad capacitor uh, and I have just had a look at that to make sure that it's holding charge. Um, so that would seem to be okay, it's certainly not causing the problem that we're seeing. Um, over here on the right hand side we've got a battery uh, monitoring circuit. Uh, and essentially this is actually just a divider circuit um, so it's got a 1 meg and a 1.8k dividing down the battery voltage and pushing that through to the analog digital converter so that we can display the voltage of the battery essentially that's all that's doing um, we can't do any testing on that and that's because it requires the plus minus 15 volts on the 741 up amp um, that's in there so um, no big deal on the 741 up amp we can replace that with anything if it's uh, if it's troublesome um, I might even have some and uh, okay what's next well we've looked at the 5 volt circuit um, this is the 5 volt regulator just here and uh, try and draw that that's nice and um, got 5 volt output there and uh, we can see as well that this one takes a 15 volt input so again we, since we don't have plus minus 15 volts um, we can't really test this circuit properly we know we're not getting the 5 volts out that we want but without the 15 volts then we're not going to be sure now it's not going to be too hard to test uh, and the the reason for that is that we can actually there's nothing to stop us um, just joining plus minus 15 volts on these two wires just here which will give us the voltage that we require um, which will give us the voltage that we require in order to run the 5 volt circuit so you know it's not going to be a huge effort to uh, actually test that but it might not be worthwhile we, we can just kind of wait till we get the 15 volts working um, there's really not a lot to go wrong on here these diodes we can test those very quickly um, these capacitors could um, be troublesome if those are um, leaking then uh, we could have an excess current through there excess current through there will cause excess current through these two transistors just here and these do get hot I have noticed so these are our two power transistors and those are most definitely um, somewhere to look um, because they deal with pretty much all of the current they're the active device that has the most current flowing through it uh, and essentially they just switch on and off opposite sides of this transformer so they, they connect it to ground so we've got 7.2 volts going into the middle of the transformer and then opposite ends alternatively get connected to ground and that causes our AC signal which comes through to here which goes through this bridge rectifier which turns into our 15 volts 
Um, but of course that's not a regulated circuit. Um, so to regulate it we have our multivibrator circuit just here. And the 15 plus minus 15 volts loops back and comes in on the left hand side of this circuit um, into the base of transistor Q130. Now um, when I looked at this circuit first of all I, I thought hang on a minute is there something wrong up there I'm missing something uh, and what I'm missing actually are these two capacitors over this side which um, essentially you're kind of dependent upon those working and holding charge um, because they're going to influence the switching of this circuit over here um, and Q120 if 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 these two Q110 and Q104 which are the two power transistors if they turn out to be okay then the next transistor we would look at is Q120 buried in this uh, green area I'll just get rid of the green area just here um, because you know that's the kind of next one up in terms of uh, in terms of having any current flowing through it the diodes themselves I will test because I generally do that as a matter of course because it's pretty quick to just plonk a meter across them and uh, and see whether they appear to be okay in the forward direction sometimes you can get fooled but um, you know there's nothing too much to fool us around here there's, a, there's some capacitors which could uh, catch us out on this bridge rectifier but other than that um, yeah that's pretty much it I think um, so I'm certainly going to take a look at these two uh, transistors and I did notice these are socketed so that's going to make that very very easy indeed um, there is an issue which is you know what's causing the problem um, and sometimes you get a chain of problems that occur in a power supply so even if we find a fault there we might not have narrowed it down feel let's make sure things are right. right let's have a look at the voltages now we don't have any loading so yeah that's still low but his input is pulled down a long way so maybe it needs to be low Take a look at a couple of other devices then. What else is it? We can actually remove these two devices just here, and that's pretty much the current path gone then from this entire section. And they come out this easy. There you go. That's how fast I can desolder a couple of transistors. They're the same transistor uh, parts, so I don't have to worry about mixing them up. But there you go, they happen to be socketed. There's no, there's, I only really just noticed because they look a bit messy soldering, and then I realised that they're actually sockets. Unfortunately, most other things are not, uh, which is a bit of a shame. So these, for example, are soldered. This FET is soldered. Um, yeah, so uh, anyway, um, useful to take those two out. Um, and say that removes a potentially high current path. Um, through the transformer um, essentially isolates uh, it doesn't quite isolate the transformer in so much as this this collector here is connected to the middle of this tap here um, but then it can't and then it can get you can't get anywhere from that um, and this end of the transformer is connected to the 9 volt line but again it can't really get anywhere so um, to a large extent that is now isolated um, and the output of this transistor here is isolated. So that's quite useful. That, that helps us just remove a whole chunk of circuit to see if that's what's causing our problem. If it is, then we have to drill down further. I still have nine volts on the input, despite the fact I've turned it on. There's my nine volts on my collector of the big transistor. It's also not drawing silly amounts of current either. Current consumption is coming from the multivibrator circuit, which is these three transistors here, the two transistors here that I've just taken out, and this guy. So I'm going to turn on the transistor tester, I guess, and uh, we will test these two transistors out of here because they are obvious candidates. So I've looked up the part number, as you can see up here, um, and a lot of data says it's a 2M5189, however, the tech data I managed to get hold of doesn't say that, it's got a different part number, um, which is a 40 volt 1 amp, and this is a 30 volt 2 amp, it says on 
the 2M5189. So yeah, two possible uh, candidates for that. Um, now I do have some transistors. I don't have a drop-in transistor replacement for that, but I do have uh, a reasonable number of transistors that will that will do one amp, and I certainly have some which are I bought for a switch mode job, which are three amp peaks. They're actually 1.5 amps, but they peak at three amps, so that would be fine. Just to get it up and running to prove that that is the problem, and then I can get replacement with this uh, transistors. So I've checked the price of those transistors. They're about five pound each, including postage. So I don't want to replace them if I don't need to. And we want to test on the first of the transistors. There we go. So we have got an HFE of 88. No leakage. Most of these other parameters are set by the actual test. So yeah, VBE 0 0.68, so that's all consistent. Nothing weird going on with that transistor, it seems. Let's try the other one. That's not to say that when we actually get into high current regions that it's not misbehaving, but uh, generally speaking, if they're going to fail, they won't pass a simple transistor identification test like this. One test again. Uh, still just running for a minute. Come on, you can do it. And we are done. We've got our result. HV74, so that's uh, consistent. VBE 0.685, so that's consistent. No IC leak, VCE sat 0.145, so that's okay. So yeah, everything looks okay about both of these transistors, which is interesting. Because if both of those are okay, but removing them removes our current drain, then what's happening? So these two transistors are sort of at the root of our problem, but they do appear to be working, um, at least as far as we can tell so far. Um, so what could cause excess current to flow through these two transistors, or one of the two transistors anyway? Well, um, generally speaking, you would have to say that this transistor here is turning them on for too long. But why? Um, and truthfully, if that was short circuiting, these would be in meltdown. You know, because essentially, if if this were permanently connecting the base of these two transistors to um, plus 7.2 volts, these would conduct pretty much flat out all of the time. And um, yeah, and and they they would they would be absolutely melting down, and they would have failed so um, spectacularly probably so you know i would kind of have to sort of say yeah there could be a problem in the multivibrator circuit that's a possibility but that's perhaps not the first place to look um, i think where i would look is in this half of the circuit and so the question that kind of comes in here is what could be drawing a lot of current here so there's four yeah four um capacitors here which are tantalum capacitors so i think they they warrant a good look at and maybe just a straight replacement without even bothering to think about them because we're probably going to really want to just recap that anyway they don't need to be tantalum they could be electrolytics they're not doing very much um and uh yeah also i guess this guy here this 741 if that's faulty and drawing too much current, um, then that is essentially discharging these capacitors too fast. And uh, what will be happening then, of course, is that this circuit over on the left-hand side will be trying to compensate for that and turning on these transistors for longer and more current will be flowing than is intended. So yeah, so I think we'll have a look at these capacitors and this 741 op amp just as a starter. So I checked the impedance between plus 12 volts and ground and minus 12 volts and ground. Um, against the actual op amp pins for the battery uh, test op amp um, that I indicated on the diagram, and the negative rail was was only about uh, ten ohms. Um, so I've popped the uh, negative rails uh, tantalum capacitor uh, and also removed the op amp, uh, and I'm going to resocket that just uh, just in case the op amp isn't a problem. I'll pop a socket in and then we can pop it back in again if needs be. Um, 
but uh, hopefully that will improve things a lot. So I'm just soldering in some new capacitors and uh, things like that. And I will just replace all the other capacitors as well. And let's see what happens now. Uh, da -da -da, positive negative still connected. Turn the output on. 29 milliamps. Somewhat annoying, no difference. Okay, so the excess current has uh, gone away, but uh, we still don't have a regulated 15 volts coming out. So I'm just going to replace the rest of the caps just to, uh, you know, I'm going to replace them anyway, so why not? So I've replaced the capacitors. Um, I've tested the 5 volt circuit. That's all working again. All my current draw is in range. Um, and I'm kind of actually running out of ideas. Um, I've done a lot of testing around the transistors in the multivibrator circuit. They all appear to be okay. All the dyes are all right. All the resistors are in range. Everything looks absolutely perfect and you would think it would work. So what I've decided to do is to feed in plus minus uh, 12 volts as though it were working. So the feedback circuit to the multivibrator has um, some activity. Uh, and I'm actually going to alter those voltages then to simulate lack of reg regulation and see if that multivibrator circuit will actually compensate for that. So that's 14.2 and we're at plus whatever. Here we go. 15.5, 16 volt, I'm done at zero now. So I am getting the change that I would expect on there. Let's bring that to 15 volts again. Um, but emitters over here, isn't it? I mean, it does pull down, but virtually not at all. See, that isn't moving. Let's pull these two transistors to remove their influence. I mean, that's toggling now at least. So yeah, I think this shows how the uh, transistor um, that, uh, that drives those two power transistors operates and toggles um, depending upon how much uh, voltage there is in that output circuit, the, uh, the actual output capacitors. And we can see that essentially this would be delivering little gulps of power whenever the voltage dropped below about 15.3, 15.2 volts. So that's how it's doing its regulation. And that takes us right back to those first two transistors that I suspected at the beginning, which tested okay, but uh, I'm kind of wondering whether I should have had the conviction of that thought and uh, perhaps popped a couple of uh, temporary transistors in anyway. I'm going to do that. And another one, thank you. Fifteen volts. These are getting just a teensy bit warm because they've probably been overdriven fraction, but uh, yeah, nice. And uh, what's the minus fifteen? I've forgotten that one there. Fifteen minus fifteen. My faults. So I should have stuck with my first instincts, but uh, I suppose at least you got a full recap and uh, yeah. Can these stay in there? No, not for long, I think. But they'll, they'll be, I mean, they're not overheating ridiculously, but.
And they shouldn't be, because, I mean, they're only drawing 100 milliamps, so it's not that bad. But uh, the peak in there might not be so great. Let's have a look at that signal now that I've been trying to get all evening. There it is. There's our input signal onto the transformer. So basically, you just get a little gulp of power every single time that the output capacitor discharges a bit. So that looks pretty clean. Uh, let's change the coupling to AC. There's our biggest spike there, about 30 millivolts. And on the minus line, pretty similar. I think I'll live with that. Cool, okay. So bar the need to get proper replacements. So I'm running these with 2N2119s at the moment, um, which I can't really remember the spec of, but I think it's probably 100 milliamp and each one is probably got about 50 or 60 milliamps running through it so uh, they should be okay but of course we don't of course we saw there's a little spike that happens uh, and that could momentarily be running a bit warm i mean these are warm to the touch but they're okay they're not bad so uh, yeah i do need to replace these two transistors here these are both testing out the same and they both test out okay but they don't work I've also got a 741 op amp that I need to replace. Um, hopefully I don't need to replace this guy here because I haven't got an LF356. Although the schematic does show that as a 741 op amp as well. So, so the power supply um, is up and running uh, and I've reassembled uh, the two boards back together. Um, it's drawing 300 odd milliamps, which is quite a lot, but uh, I think it's okay for the age of components, etc. And the fact it's got uh, LED displays on and that sort of stuff. Um, now, I do need to look at a little bit at the analog side, and I need to, uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to do the adjustments um, section of the calibration. Um, and that should enable me to, uh, to see whether or not uh, we've got sens sensible data coming out of the analog to digital converter and things like that. So these are pretty all, pretty much all Texas instrument ICs. Pretty much all 74LS. That one's in upside down, we need to just fix that. We need to give that a quick test. Just to make sure it behaves. So here is my tester, and uh, we just pick this button here. And what on what the hell is it? It's a 74LS92, so that'll be 7492 then. Just not testing power requirements and things. VCC voltage, 3 volts, lovely. Test. Yep, yeah, everything was fine. That's good. What a relief, in fact. Right, okay, let's put this back the right way around this time. Okay, great. That's back in. Correct way around now. Right, okay, so, uh, yeah. Alright, let's have a look. See what's going on then. Oh, oops. Power that on. Okay, and we're doing zero. And we're drawing 380 milliamps. So, you know what, I'm going to go with that being okay. 
Um, okay, so we've got a nice zero showing. And I'll pop it on here just to have something to stand it on for a minute or two. That looks all right to me. Adjust zero, preset instrument as listed, accept change, range selected to times 0.1. Adjust the front panel zero until the readout numerals just turn zero and the minus side just flickers off. Except that doesn't do anything. That's actually its end stop there. Go back the opposite way. It's actually come a bit loose, but it's it's turning correctly as it should do. Yeah, that's making no difference whatsoever, is it? So there's a couple of obvious possibilities as to why this is constantly reading minus 0 0.0. Um, the first is that um, the digital circuit isn't latching a new value in at all so it's busy doing all the analog stuff absolutely right and uh, we're just not getting that through onto the display the other possibility is actually that we just have zero volts on the input to the analog to digital converter so it doesn't matter what we do we never manage to affect the value so i'm going to look at the digital stuff first because it's actually quite a lot easier to look at uh, and go from there probably quite difficult to see in this video but but uh, the binary inputs going into each digit uh, have a breakout which is all the uh, test points along here so I'm just going to kind of probe those briefly I'll just do it with me uh, multimeter I think so okay we're interested in a few voltages so I'll just kind of stick this on the screw here just to get ground and then we're interested in all these voltages on these pins along here So I'm expecting to see a zero on them all, to be honest. Yeah, that's exactly what we've got, I think. So these are giving the BCD value of zero. And what the extra one there for. Point 0.1, everything's going out about point 0.1 volt, which is all zero, of course. Okay, cool. So I'm going to get the uh, scope out next, I think, and uh, the 555 timer. Okay, well, that's looking alright, isn't it? Oops. That's looking okay, I reckon. And that is switching at 36.94 kilohertz, which is a number that I vaguely recall seeing somewhere, probably in the theory of operation. There you go, the 36 kilohertz oscillator U220 supplies the continuous clock pulses for the first stage of the counter. Okay, so we're on this diagram here. 555 timers down here. This output from pin 3 goes into 14 of U225, which is a 7490. That cascades across to another 7490. So these are your counters. This is a divide by 10 counter. So this is a bit of circuit we're going to check now to make sure it's counting. Because if it's counting, then we can uh, essentially say, oh, that all works. So we come in here, we go along here, this is our first divide by 10 counter, and there's its four bits coming out into a 745 something. So I'm not quite sure what that is, 7475. Find that in a short while, it's probably just a bunch of JK flip-flops or something like that. Clock pulls from U300. I think he's clocking the data in by the looks of that. So that'll be, you know, two hertz clock or something like that, I suppose, six hertz maybe. 
um, or end of conversion pulse. That would actually make sense. What is U300? Looks like it is a six hertz end of count clock that also goes via the integrator and all that circuitry. Um, so there we go, there, that's, that's that pulse there. So this is almost certainly just some sort of latch, uh, enabling the count to be transferred from here into here. Um, okay, so divide by, divide by, and uh, not sure what that is, might be the decimal point or something like that. Don't really care that much. What we want to see really is what's happening on these counts just here, because uh, it should just be counting. So if I find U225 um, and we can look at one of its outputs, let's say out pin 11, something like that. Okay, so let me have a little probe around. So we're gonna look at the first of the binary counters then. First one in the chain. So this should have a constant signal coming because it's just coming straight out of the, seven, the 555 timer straight into these counters and they're counting all of the time. Um, and then what happens is that they obviously uh, reset and uh, we can latch the in, we can latch the reading into the next layer so then just keep counting so yeah um, so let's have a look at pin 16 is uh, 14 is the input so there's the input from the 555 timer well, this is going to be an edge input so it doesn't matter that it's a bit of a strange shape uh, and then our first output is uh, pin A, which is pin 12, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. There's our output, that's absolutely fine. Uh, next output is pin 9. That's fine, that looks a bit strange, but of course this is a decade counter, not a binary counter, so uh, if I just uh, single shot that, there we go. We can see that uh, it's obviously skipping some because uh, it doesn't count to 15, it counts to 10, of course, well, 9. Okay. Uh, missed that one, that one, yep. And that one, perfect. So um, so that's counting absolutely fine. So then that goes forward into U230, which is, uh, I don't know, some sort of latch by the looks of it. Um, and uh, let's have a look at the outputs on that. So pin 15, for example. Yeah, and that's held low. Uh, and that makes sense because that's connected directly then to the seven segment display driver. And we already know that those are low. So, um, okay, so uh, where's its clock pulse comes in? Its clock pulse comes in on pin four. And so the clock pulse would be what would allow it to uh, do its, uh, uh, you know, uh, latch the value. And there's two clock pulses actually, the pin four and pin 13. And there it is. So why have I got no data coming out of this? So I'm running some single edge just sitting there waiting for data and there's no data. So that final test basically shows that the integrator never outputs a slope that reaches the uh, test threshold. So we never actually trigger anything other than zero volts into the uh, count. So uh, now we have to move across and look at the first few stages of the analog input. So the uh, the first stage amplifier running into the uh, into the integrator. Yep, nothing's happening there. <laughs> okay, so that definitely says pin one is the input, pin two is ground. Oh, that's a short circuit pin. Shorting strap should be connected between pin 8 and 15. Oh, yeah, interesting. We've got a reading. It's all over the shop, but there's definitely a reading. And it should be on times 10. So as before, let's take a little look at the uh, circuit diagram relating to this part. So here on the left hand side at the bottom, we've got uh, the first stage of the input, which is the first amplifier essentially, uh, an attenuator circuit I suppose as well. 
and uh, above it there are examples of probes uh, and we can see that each probe essentially um, where I've got a short on my test circuit has a little uh, trimmer pot to enable the uh, the gain to be uh, adjusted for each individual probe and that uh, that trimmer pot is uh, like that one there is within the probe casing itself so uh, so yep so this is the uh, the little link that uh, is in place on the test circuit at the moment so that joins the output from uh, this 741 essentially um, yeah essentially to the first uh, of the up amps here so here we've got integration and here we've got comparator and we know we are not getting the signal that we want just here so um, first of all we have to I think or I'm going to decide that uh, there can't possibly be anything wrong with that because it's going to be difficult to replace so that's going to be the last place I look just on the hope that it's actually working and because uh, it's a lot easier to test these uh, these op amps these are known behaviors in pretty standard configurations so we can easily test them and I'm going to start with this 741 just here um, so what matters about this 741 I mean one of these one of these range switches is going to be working that is for certain so the 741 is either working or not working um, we're pretty sure that we've got 15 volts plus minus 15 volts on it um, and this is actually on the power supply board that we saw earlier um, and the other thing we've got is this zero uh, pot just here and this is a 200 ohm trimmer in series with a 75k resistor so it's got a very 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 tiny um, range so uh, I'm going to start off I'm going to have a look at that trimmer I'm going to have a look at this um, operational amplifier uh, and uh, you know that's that's our first most obvious point of failure yeah so I'm not getting what I expected out of this at all so minus 2.9 And this is having no effect whatsoever and it should of course okay well that's not good is it so what we're saying I think is that we've got a signal coming in here we've got this which I guess is a differential amplifier we've got a zero adjustment here We're splitting off, we're going into the negative here through not much of a voltage divider. Oh, mind you, we've got a 22k resistor up here. So we should be driving that circuit, we should have an input going to there. We've got a feedback loop here. And our output should be coming there, but we're getting constant output on there, which uh, would tend to lead towards this 741 being dodgy but uh, let's change the range yeah and that hasn't really made a lot of difference and it should of course have made a very significant difference because that feedback resistor fundamentally changed in the amplification loop yeah okay so we have to assume that that uh, IC is knackered um, let's see if we can flip the board without uh, disturbing everything I'm just going to turn the power off briefly yeah nearly two volts yeah not seeing a lot happening here are we and so that should be on pin six I believe which goes over to this connector here and that's our negative voltage coming back so on times a thousand we do at last get some sort of signal out it's just all over the shop though and when of course there's no real reason for it to be all over the shop I'm going to replace that IC anyway because hmm you know we've clearly got trouble at that point turn everything off and uh, start taking it apart again okay cool um, 
All right, so that's supposed to have a 741 in it, apparently. So uh, here is the 741. We could put something else in it, I suppose, but uh, okay. One nice new 741 op amp. Okay, we assemble. Ugh. At least a bit. So I've got readings all over the shop. Still got minus 2.97 on here. Uh, crap, crap, crap. Yeah, I'm also going to just double check this bloody pot here because it's really crappy, really. It's supposed to be a 200 ohm pot. A 75k resistor in. No, that isn't 75k. Well, I get 200 ohms. What I don't get is why there appears to be another resistor in parallel with it. What? Uh, no, there's something wrong there. Oh, 166, 200 ohms. This is a 503. And someone's put in parallel with a 200 ohm fixed resistor. Okay, so the IC is replaced uh, and they've put in a slightly better um more accurately matched trimmer um because this 200 ohm trimmer was in fact a 5k trimmer actually no, it wasn't it was a 50k trimmer in series with uh a 200 ohm resistor because evidently someone thought that would make it a good 200 ohm trimmer so anyway that's out now and uh, a 500 ohm trimmer is in there because that's the closest i got to 200 ohm Looking at the resistors it's sitting between, I think that'll be fine. Um, at least pretty reasonable. Um, and we do now have a stable reading, which is uh, a bonus. Uh, it's reading 6.5. Now I've set this up ready to be calibrated. So essentially what I've done here is jumpered pins 8 and pin 15. Now this is here because uh, I need to take a reading off it at some point, but for the moment, um, they're just jumpered and uh, I will try now and adjust it to get my zero point. Um, now that's a bit tricky to be perfectly honest um, because everything's a bit skewy and I haven't yet put a appropriate trimmer in um, that can be fastened to a front panel because I don't have one in stock but uh, at least this is a trimmer that hopefully we'll be able to trim down to zero. Oops, I'm going the wrong way. So it's trimming now, which is a big bonus, which means that the operational amplifier, because this is trimming that first off amp, two, one, zero, come on, you can do it. There we go. It'll lose the negative. And there we go, the negative is actually just flashing and everyone a stable zero. Excellent. Wow, it's zeroed. That's a fantastic start. Oh, it's gone negative again. Oh no, it's flashing. So I'll just need to be reading in the positive zone. There we go. That's cool. Excellent. Right. So that's done. Um, so probably what's happened is because I've been holding the trimmer, it's a thermal issue, which has made it drift when I let go. All right. So that's actually done. That's calibrated. Okay, cool. Step one. Whoa, could we be there? Oh, no, no, no. I'm not going to hope that much. Right, so that is step two of the calibration. Step three is to in adjust the internal zero. So for that we have to change the sensitivity of the times 1000 and adjust the internal zero R202, which is yeah, in here. So I'm hoping that I can kind of put this down without short circuiting anything. So switch to times 1000, adjust internal zero R202 in the same manner. Well, it's already showing zero. So, okay, let's uh, just tweak it just a shade. Um, where is my screwdriver for that? So this is R202 at the back. 3.2.1, zero. Too far. 
This one, unfortunately, is not a multi turn pot. There you go, zero. Okay, and then we switch back to point one and repeat the previous step to make sure that this is actually set to zero. And it's set to zero. Super. Oh, yeah. Right, okay, so that is step three of the calibration procedure completed. Step four is to adjust the internal voltmeter. Now for this, I have to join up a one meg resistor. Which I'm gonna solder onto this bit of wire. Because essentially, I've got to apply one and a half volts Solder my resistor to a bit of wire. So yeah, but I'll apply one and a half volts. Just fold that and hope that that will fit. To pin one. Pin nine is going to connect to ground. This guy's going to connect to positive, one and a half volts. So the idea now is I'm actually going to calibrate the voltmeter. Now this is where it looks like everything's going a bit dodgy, doesn't it really? So I've got an input on pin one. No, that is pin one. I've got a ground on pin nine. That's not correct. That needs to be on pin two. Thank you very much. On pin two. Thank you. And uh, yeah. Pin 8 and pin 15 is shorted, as they should be. Now I need to connect up my voltmeter in such a way that it can be read, like that. Put in volts. And... So that's ground. In there, stay in there, please. And now I need to read that link, and this needs to be in times 10. Uh, turn it on. Okay, I'm connected backwards here, but never mind. Um, minus 1.53. 153. So it should be 1535. There we go. 1535. Okay. Reattach probe. Okay. It'd be lovely now if this probe didn't just go potty, wouldn't it? Uh, probe, probe. Normal, right. Well, we've got a light meeting, reading. I wonder if I was just out of range there. So 11. 1 1.2, yeah, I'm just out of range, aren't I? Yeah, I'm reading 12. Put my hand in front of that. There it goes. It drops down. We're working. Okay. Phew. Okay, so I've turned the soldering station off. So, quick review of what ended up then. So we've got the J16, we've got the uh, general purpose 10 degree probe, uh, J6503. Um, um, tracking the power problem down, we found that um, it looked like a couple of transistors had blown, took those out, tested them, they were okay, put them back in, couldn't get the damn thing working. Tracing through, um, found that one of the smoothing capacitors um, was pretty much short circuited, um, which may have precipitated the whole problem to be perfectly honest. To replace that we still weren't working after tracing through transistors for hours I eventually went back to the original two replaced them with something that would kind of do the job and the power came to life. 
the five volt side was okay. So I've recapped all of the power supply board. Um, that's okay. There was also a short, there was also essentially a short circuit on the uh, 741 op amp that runs the battery test. Actually, if I run a battery check now, fingers crossed, 8.7 volts, that's near enough to be perfectly honest. Um, I'm not going to argue about that. Um, I am actually feeding 9.1. It's near enough. Um, and it's now taking uh, 330 milliamps, so that's uh, quite nice. That's dropped down uh, a bit compared to uh, with the old op amp in that I just took out. So that board is then through to looking at the analog side of things and the digital voltmeter, which essentially is a, you know, uh, uh, analog to digital converter. So first things first, it appeared that all the driving for the display was working. Um, and then stepping back, it looked like we weren't getting data latched in, but is that because we haven't got any data to latch in or is it because of something else? So I went through the calibration procedure um, which essentially the first step of that calibration procedure, or third step actually, when you feed in an artificial voltage, read back the loop um, that comes out from the first operational amplifier, and that was a million miles off. Looking at that operational amplifier, it's constantly saturated. So replace that operational amplifier, and that looked like it had improved things a bit, but it still wasn't trimming correctly. Um, then I had a look and someone had a, done a bodge on it where they'd put in a five, uh, sorry, a 50k resistor where there should have been a 20, sorry, a 200 ohm resistor. So they put a 50k trimmer in where there should have been a 200 ohm trimmer. Um, and to compensate, they'd just shorted it across with a 200 ohm um, resistor. Now, so that's a crappy um, idea. Um, so... I replaced that with a 500 ohm, which was the closest I had got. Um, now, I wasn't too worried about that because it's in series with a 75K resistor. Um, so I wasn't too worried that I was uh, altering anything too much with that, but um, I could always um, uh, order the right resistor later. So, um, two 741 up amps, two transistors, um, and a bunch of electricity caps um, in place of the old tantalums that were on the back. And we appear to be up and running. Um, we've run the calibration, we've got a nice stable light figure coming out of our light probe now. Um, we've been able to calibrate the zero uh, in all the ranges. We've been able to um, feed in a voltage um, and read out that voltage on the digital voltmeter and compare it to um, this uh, four and a half digit voltmeter here and get that all trimmed up. So now it just appears to be working. Um, so there's a couple of things that I need to do now, um, and I'm not going to do them in this video. Um, I do need to order a couple of proper replacement transistors, um, and I need to order another trimmer that will actually fasten to this front panel, because the one that I've got in there temporarily at the moment, it doesn't fasten to the front panel, so it's very difficult to trim. Um, but other than that, we're kind of all right with it. Um, yeah, is there anything else that needs replacing? Um, I had to replace two 741 op amps um, and I only had two in stock, so I need to order some more of those as well. So in total, the repair I reckon is gonna cost about 15 pounds, which yeah, is marginal as to whether or not it was worth it to be perfectly honest. I think I paid about that for the unit in the first place, um, which makes it about a 30 pound unit plus quite a lot of hours of my time, but um, but anyway, you know, it's up and running now. We've completed the repair um, and uh, I will try and cut together something from that that makes some sense. So anyway, I hope you enjoyed that. Um, if you did, please give it a thumbs up. Don't forget to subscribe, uh, leave comments, of course, and I'll see you next time. Bye for now.